Pack Radio, a podcast produced by Winding Trails Media for writers by writers. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. And 45 minutes ago, we began. But who knows how this story begun. <laughs> but have an interesting time writing next week. No, Right Pack Radio begins now. <laughs> Welcome to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas. Now breaking into the audio play industry with Winding Trails Media, which brings you this episode of Writers Writing for Writers. And with me today is, I'm going to start off here. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm going to start off there. <laughs> Good or Amos. Uh, I write Victorian Who Done It's like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis. And my new book just out, Mayhem at Buffalo Bills Wild West. Come and see me in Sedalia, Missouri at Reader's World on June the 4th in the afternoon between 2 and 4 o'clock. And if you're not there, if you're still in St. Louis, why well, then come on July 9th to the Central Library downtown where I'm going to be telling people about poisons. Ooh, fun. Not good. I am Brad R. Cook, author of The Iron Chronicles, which is a young adult steampunk novel. Uh, Iron Lotus, the third in the series, will be coming out this November, so check it out. And until then, definitely check out A Clockwork Heart, my award-winning short story, which you can find on Amazon right now. I am Dante Carlisle, the writer of Hiding Blind, a book about finding a ray of hope in even the darkest of situations. I'm Lee Savage, author of Radica for the Truly Wicked, <laughs> and under the name Carrie Lee Williams, also children's books. I always love that combination. <laughs> I'm, sorry. Sorry. I'm Melanie Planey, author of science fiction, nonfiction, and fantasy, and I am almost done with the uh, first draft of an audio play, but I start a brand new milk painting job tomorrow, so who knows what I'm Hey. And my name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I'm currently working on self-publishing my uh, fantasy novel, though. So if you'd like to keep up with that, check it out at www.threadcaster.com. That's thread like string and caster like magic. Excellent. <laughs> okay, and today, just to kind of apologize to our normal audience who are probably looked at, listened to the beginning of this going... What the heck just happened? We're going to talk about flashbacks and how to writing, how to write flashbacks, or should you write flashbacks? Where do they belong? Are they just an excuse to do a prologue? Uh, are are they an excuse for replacement of a prologue, and so forth? So, what is the industry saying, and what is your opinion about flashbacks? What do you like about them? What do you do not like about them? Should you even write them? Let's define a flashback. Okay, flashback is. Flashback is a break in the current, quote-unquote, present tense of your novel, where all your characters are and the stuff is happening for us to uh, picture it Sicily, you know, 1905 or whatever, and go back and have a completely different story for a moment, and it can be very jarring. Uh, usually it's used to tell backstory or to uh, further develop characters and and it's a bit clunky at times there's so all... tell us what you really feel about <laughs> that <laughs> and yet there's also another way to write flashbacks where it's actually your story is told in flashback leading up to the current moment so in other words you give a hint of some exciting moment that's occurring right now then you go into the background of the story you come back to the excitement. So it can be you, used as a gimmick. You, you start guess. off with yeah. a guy falling off a building, and then you tell the entire story of how the guy got to the building to fall off of. As, yeah, an, exactly. as an excuse to put the exciting bit in the first five pages for your editor to read, or your agent to possibly read and pick you up, and then you go back to where the story actually starts. Now, and perhaps. It's not just that. It's also um, to hook your reader. Maybe, and, but I think it has a lot to do with, you know... Showing the, the, the fun bits at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Like I said, booking your reader. 
Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess we should throw out the big rule of thumb is not to start a book with flashback. Or a dream. Um, or yes, anything. or a dream. Anything that's not your actual story. Yeah, start off with actual narrative and, and you're good. Um, so that, that, that's probably just needs to get thrown out there right now. Just boom. Mm-hmm. If you've got a flashback in the beginning uh, and a prologue, yeah. um, take a writing class. No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't need to be I'm mean. kidding. No, no, no. We're being mean at flashbacks, not yes. at people who write flashbacks. This is very true. But yeah, and I do have to say, though, they are an actual, like, really lovely technique. Um, and the other thing I would warn against is doing a flashback in a flashback. <laughs> Those yes. are really bad, unless you watch Deadpool, and then, yes, it did work. But that was for comedic effect, and, you know. It's, uh... There's a reason he turned to the camera and said, I'm breaking the fourth wall in the fourth wall. That's 16 walls, you know. <laughs> Just real quick, I'm going to say, though, what who really uses flashback, now I'm going to say way too much, hmm. has been a lot of television shows. And so it's in television writing, where you give some dramatic moment, and then you suddenly get... 18 hours earlier, or whatever. Well, Highlander made its entire, you know, oh, series yeah. off of the flashback. Yes. Hmm, I meet the bad guy. Let me think back onto the last time I met the bad guy in 1752. <laughs> Do you or know what else? In <laughs> yeah, 1612 or whatever. Something else that makes its entire runtime based on a flashback is called How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> yes, that's true too. Right. Yeah. Did we get tired of that gimmick after a while? Some did. Some yeah. got tired of that gimmick. Fedora. Well, I think they can be effectively used. Just today, I happened mm-hmm. to see a Miss, Miss Fisher's Mysteries, which is a... I'm sorry, I'm clapping because the, this, these shows are excellent. Go ahead. They are very well done. They're hour and a half mysteries, which were produced in uh, Australia, and they're mm-hmm. set in Melbourne. And I think that today's flashback was used especially well because... The story began in a normal way right there in Melbourne in in 1928. Miss Fisher wearing glorious clothes, as she (laughs) always does. And an old friend of hers from Paris, because she had been in the war, in World War II, pops up Mm -hmm. and uh, they have a conversation and and so on and so on. So they get back together and we have then a floor. We have a grounding spot for the flashbacks, which go back to her time in Paris and an obsessive lover. Yes, that actually has a great episode. It is, and it's very well done. And there are several flashbacks to the France of World War I uh-huh. that are very nicely done and fit in perfectly for the time. I think that that is really the key. Whatever you do in writing, if you do it at the right time and you do it well, it's going to work well. Yep. Right. There's a saying, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brad. There's a saying saying that yeah, goes... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see Jen's finger, so it's, Jen will be next. Well, um, <laughs> They learn the rules and then learn how to break the rules correctly. Go ahead, Jen. Well, um, I pitched a big fit about flashbacks because I wanted y'all to fight me. Good. Um, we'll fight. Flashbacks are very useful, but it's all about telling a story. I wanted to bring up the the real pro flashback thing that I had prepared uh, about them, which is show don't tell. If you have an epic amount of backstory that a character needs to lay us down on then the flashback has everything to do with what's going on at present. Like, if everyone in the room needs to catch up on what happened to this guy 20 years ago, and you want to flashback and and show us what happened 20 years ago instead of all of us sitting around listening in rapt attention as he recalls it in dialogue tags, then the flashback is done very well. That's a good place for a flashback because it's more interesting for the reader, it's more engaging, and it's actually better writing in that case. What was your favorite term about a certain couch? Uh, there's That would be a bamboo trap scene, actually. Okay, even worse. In which the bamboo trap scene is the scene in which uh, the plot is going along very nicely until all of a sudden we fall into a bamboo trap and get snared on sharpened bamboo sticks at the bottom for a while, otherwise known as sit in a circle and talk about what the audience already knows. Right, well, you're And we sit fair. around in pain waiting for it to be over, and then climb out of Bamboo Trap and you keep walking at the exact same pace at the same path that you were on before. Jen, I'm glad to know that you just love flashbacks so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, Sorry, uh, we had a plot cat come through. <laughs> I'm getting used to it. It's um, so actually, that, that's exactly what I was just about to talk about, because uh, 
in in Iron Lotus actually, I I had that exact situation. So. Uh, one of my favorite ways to use flashbacks is to tell history. I was making fun of Highlander for doing it, but, you know, mm-hmm. I do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of the things I love to do because, uh, you know, when you're telling history, if you're just sitting around talking about history, it can get incredibly boring. Mm-hmm. Um, however, uh, so in Iron Lotus, there's a huge chunk of history that needs to get told. And originally, I had them actually reading it out of the book. Mm. So, yeah, oh. so it was like modern to the characters. You think that, yeah. Yeah, well, it was, it was, it was a little bit more interesting than it sounds. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So, and, and I decided because you know my critique group was like, no, let's not do it this way. Yeah, it's compelling um, cinema when they yeah, yeah. read from a book for a chapter. It is, <laughs> and it was actually fairly compelling. Uh, but now it's you know it's much more elaborate and it's told more in a point of view. And I, I guess one could argue whether it's a true vision or a flashback, because it's technically both. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, and for that, it becomes much more compelling. You're actually seeing it, you're actually there, you know. You get the senses involved. Exactly. So I, I do think flashbacks can totally be a wonderful thing. I do think they can be overused, though. They can be gimmicky when used improperly. Exactly. Um, in my book, Shadows of My Past, the second of the St. Louisville Vampire series, I use a a psychic in order to do my flashbacks because as she has contact with her lover, she sees his past love, Mm -hmm. who she identical. So she actually sees herself in the place of this person. So that puts everything in present. Mm -hmm. So I found that as a way to kind of make it present. And I do relate it to her. Mm -hmm. But you have to keep along with the story to find out how it relates to her. It's very important, too. The flashback should have everything to do with what the current action is as well. Mm -hmm. That's I'm I'm kind of in agreement with Jennifer on I I can't stand them I don't <laughs> like them I don't like using them and I almost feel that it's if you have to break the scene in order to put one in the scene becomes much less compelling and I'm one of those people that I the the less detail that I can put in and still convey the story the better mm-hmm. so if two characters have history if there was a situation like he was saying with Highlander obviously I mean that's Every episode is like, here, let's tell us, tell you what happened 300 years ago. Uh-huh. But it's it's almost more compelling if you can feel the tension, see the tension, there, there are half-hearted hints, drops, and that kind of thing in the dialogue between what happened to them. I enjoy doing that a lot more than actually putting in, like, you know, here's, here's five uh-huh. pages on what happened 60 years ago. Uh-huh. Which, but then again, I can, I can see Fedora's point that if it's well done... And it adds a certain flair to the story itself. Mm-hmm. Then it can be well done, but it's it's, but it's rare. Hard to where, do, but good yes, writing is exactly. hard to do in general, it's, anyway. Yeah. It's rare where they're necessary. Yeah. I don't remember the mo- the name of the movie, but there was a black and white movie that I watched recently. That it started out with a guy had a bandage around his eyes, and he was sitting in an interrogation room. This and is a p- movie with Dick Powell as, star- as Sam Spade. And the uh, point is that he was telling the story to the cops, and as he told the story to the cops, he it started the flashback where the story started. The issue with this, actually I had two issues. One, there was a subplot that I don't see why the cops would be interested in, the subplot. <laughs> and then the second issue was there was a time when he actually ran into the cops and talked to the cops before you got to the present, mm-hmm. and I thought the flashback was over. But then uh, Dave pointed out that no, his eyes aren't bandaged. They were still in the flashback. Mm-hmm. A flashback and a flashback. No, yeah. no, no flashback. And a or just flashback. a super long flashback. Yeah, a, a flashback similar was the scene. Entire movie. Yes. Oh. If anybody's interested, the movie she's referring to is called Murder My Sweet. You see her, I believe. Isn't that a Philip Marlowe? Yeah, Philip Marlowe. I said the wrong one. Well, I said Sam Spade. Uh, I think it went Brad's. Yeah, dead. so, uh, you know, um, I did the old Googling. <laughs> and I found something kind of interesting. Um, this is a Huffington Post article by Dave Astor, who points out the fact that the flashback is actually a modern trope. Mm. And there are very few books that are pre 20th century that feature flashbacks. But I will point out, pre 20th century, they had something called the prologue. Yes. <laughs> But uh, that now we have non-chronological storytelling mm. uh, as a major feature of 20th century storytelling, hence the flashback. 
Interesting. I'm curious. I'm going to just quickly and then <laughs> quickly ask everybody, who here around the table has read Frankenstein? Besides me. No, I haven't read it. Okay. No. I'm, I've got the book mixed with the radio drama that I think Orson Welles was in. Don't hold that to me. Radio drama of it with something else. Was the book told in flashback? Because the radio drama was. Um, I, read I don't it, recall I read it in high school. I, I don't remember. recall it either. Oh, yeah, because right, we that. start in the Arctic. It, just like the radio drama. That's yes. what I thought. Yeah, Yeah, and Wuthering Heights was also told in flashback. Okay. But that's the... That, no, that's he points out a couple that. of books that are, but it's not a major trope mm -hmm. until the 20th century. And these aren't yeah. these examples that we're drawing aren't the ones where they're, they are you know running from the villain... And then they stop quickly and say, wait, let me tell you about what happened five years ago. Okay? In the case of a flashback as a framing device, uh, one of my favorite movies, and spoiler alert, uh, is um, The Usual Suspects. And to that end, that framing device is used expertly. Yes. But it's a framing device that also comes back to the present often. Uh, it's the equivalent of... Um, you know, the Crypt Keeper opens his book and reads us a story. Mm -hmm. So but the whole mystery is, you know, who's Kaiser Sose? And we're putting together the mystery in flashback because they're doing, conducting interviews and trying to assemble the story the way that you would if you were the cop. We are in the point of view of the cops, and the cops are listening to the story. Uh, it works in cinema. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, you know, I say, yeah, it would work in, in a book. I don't... Is The Usual Suspects a book? I'm not entirely I sure. Uh, but it'd be it's, it would be difficult to do. Uh, the problem you run into with that, though, is when people are supposed to be sharing orally their adventure, people don't talk in dialogue. <laughs> you know, when you when I'm sitting are here, are you serious? He said shocked. And uh, if I'm going to sit here and tell you about how my day went, I'd be like, I woke this morning to the sound of birds. It was a cold day for May. I wasn't sure, but I knew I needed a sweater. That's not how I tell a story, you guys. I said, I woke up and it was freaking cold. <laughs> so it's, it, that kind of breaks the suspension of disbelief if you put too much thought into it, which is why I say if you're going to use it as a framing device, like don't return to the present too often. Do it and you know, be, be judicial with the way that you use a flashback and take into account what the scene actually is that you're writing. If the scene is a guy saying, well, here, this is how it happened, and then we do the slide whistle and we go back in time and we see how it happened, that doesn't feel as bad as, you know, he, he opened his mouth and began to tell the story in this way, and then we come back to the future and says, did he really say that? Oh, yes, he really did say that. And we go back to the past again, and it's really weird. Yeah. Well, I think, <laughs> just to jump in real quick, I think that that movie, uh, The Usual Suspects, you know, I don't think it would have worked telling it in a linear story fashion. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you think about the way that it goes, we would have seen everything, mm -hmm. and then we would have been there in the police. You know, there'd be no build up. The entire yeah. build of that movie is who is Kaiser Sose, and the entire point of that movie is that there is all this build up to the reveal. To the reveal, and that build up comes from the interviews that are going on right there. I think without that, you wouldn't have had that. So. You know, this is why I say flashbacks can work if yeah. you're if you're doing them right. I think yeah. it really also depends on the media too, mm -hmm. as you're pointing out. I've lost track of water. Are you still going? Oh, I'm done. Who's next? <laughs> um, so I want to just warn that when you're doing the flashback, like when he was mentioning a five-page flashback, mm -hmm. that you might want to be careful not to info dump. Mm -hmm. Keep mm -hmm. it interesting. Sometimes it might be a little shorter. You know. Mm -hmm. um, Mine, I spread mine out because as the character continues contact, she ends up, she can't control her flashbacks, so, or actually psychic premonitions from his past, um, but I keep them short, that way it's, it's not info dumping everything, and I want to say a book that I read that kind of did the framing of like, kind of like this, it starts out where she's old and then retells the story of her past and her love, and it was an it's older a, romance novel. A Titanic it? <laughs> it's Rebecca Brandywine's Up on a Moon Dark Moor. Hmm. And I liked that one. No, no. You guys want to shoot for it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Paper, rock, scissors, uh, scissors. So what I was going to say is, so we've talked about the info, the information dumping, you know, like part, like why you use flashbacks, because they're, they're, they're a literary device that you use for reasons. Uh -huh. 
you know, a great reason that his history works so well, imparting history, the Highlander or whatever, is because the character couldn't physically be there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably one of the best ways to use a flashback is when your character can't physically be in the story that needs to be told, but that needs to be imparted to the reader. You know, memories of the past are really kind of a, a classic one because the story we're currently telling is linear to itself, but they're older now and they're looking back upon the past. And that's a really classic trope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I think if you if you use the flashback right for certain literary devices, yeah, I should say as a literary device to tell your story, then I think, you know, you can get away with it. But I think if you're just jumping back to tell the story from five minutes ago uh -huh. that could have been just a chapter ago <laughs> instead of being the chapter that it currently is, that's probably not the best use of a flashback. Uh, real quick, to intro, you know, stick into that. When you're writing, unlike in a movie, uh, if you're in the present, you know, like present day Highlander, and they're, everyone's older and wiser, and we look back on when they were young kids, um, if you're writing it, since it is a flashback, you have to decide if you're writing it as a reflection of the past, in which the tone of the narration should be that of the older person. Like as stand opposed, by me. Yes. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the tone of the younger person, which if that was present tense and that's the mindset that the protagonist is, the tone of the narration should be of that younger person. So that's just something I wanted to throw in while I, after you mentioned that. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Stephen King, I was just thinking It is also yeah. told with a bunch of flashbacks and that's yeah. what works well. In fact, he's a huge fan of the flashbacks. Yeah, he loves mm -hmm. flashbacks. Also bullies. Yeah, but uh, another thing that's technically not a flashback, but kind of feels like it, but it works real well, is The Prince's Bride. Mm. In that case, all the so-called so flashbacks are assigned by the author, and it's a literary device that makes it perfectly obvious what's happening, and he's supposedly editing this classic book. It's also a humor. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a, a comedy. Device. It's not supposed to be taken exceptionally seriously. Mm -hmm. Flashbacks are useful for keeping things hidden. And this can be done well, even in the most absurd kind of trope. For example, The Born Identity, a movie which I absolutely adore. Yes. But it uses the stupid, stupid trope of amnesia, for goodness sake. But look at how well they do it mm -hmm. with our traveling excitedly through Jason Bourne's unimaginable world and getting just little glimpses of his of his traumatizing past so that we can understand the story by drips and drabs and then finally of course there's the big reveal at the end but it is a great device for keeping things hidden and it's not that I'm suggesting that anyone should use amnesia but maybe if you do it as well as that, I'd let you. Yeah, if you can do it as well as Robert Loveland did. Yeah. yeah. Now, when he wrote Go Born Identity, it. though, uh -huh. it, wasn't, it wasn't an overused trope as it is now. Yeah. Video games True. were not around yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that Jennifer was saying about how <laughs> normally when storytelling is used as a way to do flashback is, is not written in dialogue, and the best place that I've ever seen that done is in fantasy novels, mm -hmm. where, you know, the authors created this unimaginably massive world and you have this character of course you have the wise old counselor character who's like well I have a story to tell you uh -huh. and they always cut out of dialogue suddenly they'll write you know this this story that the that this character is telling as mm -hmm. if you know that is the narrator on the page that is us writing that yeah and that is been physically transported to the time in which there's yes there. exactly that becomes the narration that becomes that immediate spot and I mean that's uh the one place where the the story I think storytelling outside of the dialogue is done well if in I, fantasy uh -huh. a I, too much I was just thinking about uh, something I read in 11th grade uh, English literature no American literature definitely American literature is this a flashback? So, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it, it is uh, Mark Twain the jumping frog of whatever county Calavera yes. Calavera yes. County the thing is he was a storyteller, and what we wrote, what we read, was the text of what he was actually saying when he would get in front of audiences. So I don't. It's been too many years since I uh, read it to remember, mm -hmm. but that is a very good example. If anyone wants to go back and actually read it, of what actual storytellers are actually telling people when they're the storyteller for the audience. And if you want to write one of those characters, I recommend reading the story. Well, a Hobbit. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, now it's kind of a classic trope, but uh, when he did it, it wasn't necessarily. But the the old grizzled character who sits down to write a book of their experience that they've just gone through, and then the page magically morphs back in time, and suddenly, mm-hmm. you know, you're in the Shire. So, but yeah, it's you know, it's a whole thing where you can, you know, a, a way of flashing back, and that's kind of a you know a storytelling technique. The plot cat comes back through. Yes. <laughs> give, we all give pause for the passing of the plot cat. It's a flashback. <laughs> uh, uh, and a flash forward. <laughs> so, go ahead. Well, what I suggest is that one should always use the best means at hand for doing whatever it is you need to do in the story. And if that's a flashback and if you can do it well, fine. I think in general, a better modus operandi is to insert little bits here and there when they are needed Mm -hmm. and that will keep the story from being bogged down with with excessive stuff and stuff that people can't uh, can't process at the time that you give it to them so little bits of dips and drabs are better in general I think than flashbacks and also adds weight to those bits because Mm -hmm you have a moment to say, oh, well, that's an interesting bit of information instead of receiving it all in one huge chunk that you have to swallow. And it's wondering what it's there for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the key. Yeah. Are you asking your reader to, to wonder why it's there? Yeah, why did they bring that up at this yeah. time? It must have some bearing to the current story. Wait, I'm still concerned with the current story while I'm learning about the past. It's a miracle. Or they forgot the current story and say, I'm going to throw this damn book on the floor. Uh-huh. And I think that's ha- I've, I've talked about it never. I'm not going to mention the name of the book, though those around here know the name <laughs> of a certain book in which Watch I read. Watch the back library. Yeah, yeah. Um, where um, I almost threw it in the trash. It was that, it had a, if I remember right, the book was about 950 pages, and I want to say 700 of that was a flashback. <laughs> right? Blah! Right in the middle. Go ahead. Yeah. And I just wanted to say, if you are going to do flashbacks, try to relate it to the current story. What have something in that present time that triggered that flashback be relatable to the flashback? So then it's easier transition. I don't know if this is flashback or just point of view, but uh, I'm going to throw out uh, Zero Time by T.W. Finley, who hey. has multiple points of view running through her book. Uh, and the beauty of it is, is that they take place in both the past, the present, and the future. Mm-hmm. So that events that take place in the past affect the future and the present, you know, and kind of work through. And you're jumping, you know, from chapter to chapter into different time periods and stuff like that. You can follow it easily because of the characters. But because of that, it's not told in flashback. It's not like you're learning about the the history of something when you're in the present. It's not like we're way far flung into the future and having to read about all this or seeing it in a hologram or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so because of that, uh, it's a really effective storytelling device. Well, uh, to to add to that and also to further sell T.W.'s book, um, one of the really (laughs) cool sort of world-building bits of that novel and other novels she's written, specifically that novel, is that it's got a compression of time. Yeah. Like, even though it's happening in the distant past... And in the present and in the future, it's actually all happening at the same time. Correct. It's just that time travel is a it's more of changing the location than it is t- changing a temporal position along a timeline. So we all start at the same time, and all mm-hmm. of our characters stand around. It's like, okay, here's the plan. You good? You good? You good? Okay, Team A go there. Team B go there. Team C go there. We all jump in the wormhole, and we come out in different times on Earth. And all of those stories all play into the same point that we started at. Yes. Even though you have to leave a message for the guy in the future by burying it in the past, and then he has to go find it. Yeah. It's Which, really interesting. Yeah, because it's a really so interesting you, you way. You talked me into checking yeah, this out. But instead, of, <laughs> yeah, but instead of it being like a straight flashback or something crazy like that, using these POV characters to kind of run through these you know stories kind of gives you that that aspect. And mm-hmm. But is that a... I mean, I don't really consider that a flashback. That's like she was saying earlier with that's, that's an all, alternative. Frame. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's, frame like I said, I wasn't yeah. exactly certain if I'd call it a flashback, but it's a great way of using, using what would time. be normally... Yeah, using yes. like, you know, because, you know, we were talking earlier about history 
being a great imparting history being a great way of using a flashback mm -hmm. this is a way of kind of doing that without actually using a true flashback I was gonna say what uh, I lost it <laughs> <laughs> all right then. lost that one um, it'll come just, back. Uh, yeah. Flashback. Yeah. Um, talking about the drips and drafts method, I say that, again, that can be a very effective way and that lets you know the important, if you can just put in the important things without putting in all the information, but um, another reason is it really maintains the mystery. Mm -hmm. For instance, in a story I'm not working on at the moment, but I'm going to get back to really one We're of these times. Holding you to it. Holding you to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, my main character's mother died about eight years before the story started. You know that, but you don't know how in the details, and it, it does matter, mm -hmm. but you find that out throughout the book. You'd give them little pieces as the book goes on. Right, okay. and hopefully yeah. it'll keep them interested. <laughs> Sometimes a flashback can be used to be the actual mystery, mm -hmm. to be the <laughs> plot, be the actual thing that's driving the plot. And what just made me think of that is a movie, which was directed by Alfred Hitchcock, Spellbound. Where the main character, Amnesia, has, has lost, his, lost his memory due to a traumatic event, and that's as far as I'm going to tell you. But throughout the entire movie, they're trying to, he's trying to figure out who he is, what he is. So it's like Bourne, except with a different background. Yeah, I was going to say that's Bourne's. Yeah. And like every mm -hmm. video game that came out in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Or early two thousands, I, like I should say. Gonna wake up with all these. <laughs> I should say skills. every two yeah. thousands, the two thousands. That was like the biggest trope. Yeah. Because then you had to learn what it in your well, life. It, yeah, it's when it changed from being uh, the main character has amnesia. Now we have to learn everything to the main character has amnesia, and we have to learn everything. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. the tone of voice comes from how tired we all are. Yeah. Of it. The, the reason why that would work so well in video games is because the player doesn't one. know anything yeah. at exactly. the start, right. Right. and it saves. That's why it became a trope. Yeah. Because it was a really easy way of imparting gameplay. Yeah. And it saves the player from having to read bunches of backstory, and it's a whole lot cheaper than programming in all this backstory movie. And nobody ever looks at the tutorials. Yeah. No yeah. Just making nice stuff in audio logs about the stage and force people oh, to geez. stop what they're doing and listen to yeah. it for a couple of minutes while there's like bad guys up and we're shooting at you. Yeah. Borderlands. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of Bioshock. Oh, yeah, there's a dozen of them that do the that. Bioshock wasn't too bad. At least they let you run while they were playing. <laughs> yeah. If you uh, if you look up all the backstory kernels in that first Halo story, in the first Halo yeah. game, you have to actually stop at the terminals and watch like, the text scroll across. I never looked them up. I looked them up About like halfway through, later. it says, game over. You're like, what happened? Oh, yeah, well, I was reading all that. I was playing a game. I was yeah. trying to read this book. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> what, what have... Who here has written a flashback that they really wish they had never written? How about one that we deleted? That works yeah, for me. That's... I, I wrote one I deleted. My novel that I pitched earlier today, uh, Threadcaster, used to start with this huge like flashback prologue in which we introduced the, one of the main characters as a six-year-old, and he's asking his grandpa to tell him a story. I deleted that first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote one, and since the uh, you know I haven't sent a publisher or anything, I still could get rid of it if I chose, uh, but I need to tell information about about a marriage that didn't happen, okay? I need to tell that information, and I can't figure out a better way to do it than to have my main character daydream it, which is really a flashback. And it's kind of long. I don't think it's boring, but it is kind of long. Are and it does interrupt the story, and uh, I'm right? open for advice, <laughs> folks. We can workshop it if you want. <laughs> May I do? I had a conversation. Huh? I'm not going to use too many spoilers because it's on the novel that I'm currently uh -huh. pimping out as hard as I can. Okay. That, uh, here. There's, it's, it's, there's a few dream sequences, but they actually go along with the story that it's not... It's not like flashbacks. It's none of that. But there, there were more, and I probably deleted about sixty percent of them. <laughs> I just got to the point where I, I had, I would sit there and read through it. And I'm like, you know what? I don't even know what's happening in the story anymore. Mm -hmm. This is getting ridiculous. And half of the things got deleted. And there was one in there that the flashback it had to happen because it was like she said, it was the driving force of the story. Mm -hmm. There is you have to wonder, you know, okay, how did. How did this character get here? Mm -hmm. And eventually it's told, but it's told 
I broke the fourth wall twice. So I, I hit the 16th wall. It was very well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, to Fedora's comment of, you know, how do you get rid of it? Or to anyone who's looking to get rid of their flashbacks, you're really left with conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, conversation can be a great way of imparting information. We talk about cabbage heads all the time. Uh, you know, and something along the lines of, you know, one character explaining something to another character, telling the story, therefore telling the story to the reader. Uh, is that the only one? By God, no. Um, <laughs> but that is that is definitely one way you can get around it. Anytime I'm starting to info dump, I hate that. So I instantly try and find a way that I can switch this entire page around to a conversation. Um so you and want to get it off the couch? That was what exactly. I had to do. Yeah. That was that was my eventual fix for it. I also love to pick up an object and ask its origin or recollect or something like that. Keep it brief. I mm-hmm. am one of the other novels that's a work in progress, Embrace of the Mor- Immortal, which is the third book of the St. Louisville Vampire series. So I'm currently working on the prequel. I am trying to find a way to find a new way to do the flashback because I have a very old original vampire that I need to tell the backstory to. Mm. And so I don't want to do traditional flashback. I already did psychic, so I'm working on that. And that is one of the re- one of the reasons why I've delayed that and started working on Surrender to the Night. If it's, uh, if it's an a big enough story and yeah, integral enough to the plot why story, not make it its own yeah. novella and write it and publish it separately possibly hmm. but, yeah. but, but the part, prequel. part of it is supposed to be a secret of who she really is until the end you're mm-hmm. not supposed to find out who she really is until closer to the end is so. it have is there a plot happening in the present with the present tense characters mm-hmm. that is in essentially important to have all this knowledge already built in leave it a mystery and make that i mean whenever you find out at the end you're still kind of wondering i mean obviously everyone reacts with all or however you want them to react Mm -hmm. to her and then immediately you've already got the novella ready like oh if you're still wondering who this (laughs) if you want some more backstory i mean Mm Anne rice did that great on a lot of the on with much of the same way with pandora Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That she had the Pandora character, and she eventually released uh, a whole yeah. novel with about her. I don't know. Yes, yeah, speaking of flashback, interview with a vampire. Yes, <laughs> yeah. side note. That's okay. They're getting ready to do a reboot. Yeah, of oh, interview with a vampire. Oh, really? I was say an interesting flashback. Funny that you should be talking about vampires because I was actually sitting <laughs> back and thinking. Funny. She's always talking about. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. But yeah. my mind was actually there. Um, I am not talking about the movie that recently came out with Johnny Depp called Dark Shadows. I am talking about the actual TV show. Which one? Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows. Yeah, but no, they, no, no, did no, you, they did I two. love it. I love that you did that. Actually, in, in both cases, in both cases, they did this. But they, I, I like how they did it in the original Dark Shadows okay. better than in the more modern 1990s. Which got canceled. She, yes, it got canceled, and I was so mad. Yeah, so was I, because that's oh, actually what no. introduced me to Dark Shadows. Um, Barnabas, who, Barnabas Collins, who is somebody who's turned into a vampire back in the late 1700s, we don't know his whole story. We go through what would be nowadays the equivalent of a good full two seasons, I think. And then suddenly we have a time travel jump with the main, with one of the main characters, goes back to the origin and is thought to be someone else. And she's completely out of her mind with how am I back here and how is Barnabas here as well Mm -hmm. and she's living through a time period where she gets turned into a vampire and after that and all the tragedy that hits the Collins family and then gets transported back to present day and there's Barnabas and she's like afraid so they didn't handle it quite as well in the second version, but they, I still liked it as well. I don't know, did they even get to that part? Yeah, because I, I... I still remember Barnabas being shot, and or rather Barnabas and his brother in that one being having the duel, and the witch has the ball that should have been in Barnabas's... Spoiler alert. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry! Wait, 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 that is an old TV show yes. that's off the air, so if you haven't seen it, you yeah. know. And sadly, the old TV, the old, old 1960s black and white to color used to be on Netflix. Now it's been taken off of streaming on Netflix. I think you still get the DVDs. The, I haven't checked this in a while, but last time I looked, Hulu had the 1990s version 
on streaming. Oh but. yes, and the the original version of the soap opera was recorded and filmed live. Mm -hmm. Yes, that that it was also interesting to watch that situation. Go ahead. Um, I think that brings us to another option for the flashback. Mm -hmm. Uh, and an example I would like to draw showing this option, which is an actual physical or mental transport through time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, obviously not for for great use in many places, but sometimes it's appropriate, and a good place that they use that is actually in the Harry Potter series. Mm. There's a gizmo in Dumbledore's office called the Pensive that you can stick your head mm -hmm. in and see the past. And it's pretty great, because not only does our main character, Harry Potter, stick his face in the past, but he gets physically transported, quote unquote, as a ghost into the past to not only s witness what happened there, and it's not even the past, it's specific memories of specific people that you can plug in. I was just um, watching that the other day. Yeah, so he gets a chance to not only see what happened in the past, but he gets to smell and taste and feel and, you know, he can explain, you know, he can, he's witnessing it and so therefore we're also witnessing it and that's how it's not... It could have been told the exact same way with Dumbledore sitting on one side of his desk and Harry sitting on the other side of his desk mm -hmm. and then just talk about it, which would have been interesting because it was an interesting story about mm -hmm. this big, uh, you know, tribunal court but case. creating a magical device but is so a, much more fun. And, and then having us be physically <laughs> yes. there, it, mm -hmm. you know, I still remember that scene. I read all seven of those books and there's quite a lot of them that I don't remember in vivid detail. <laughs> I remember that scene because I remember thinking, wow, this is a cool gizmo. Ooh, mm -hmm. we're in the past. Oh, who's that guy? And for the plot of that book, this being the fourth book, uh, we needed to remember who that guy was really mm -hmm. strongly because he was really important later, but he doesn't show up anywhere except in the past. Yeah. Hmm. So, David Tennant, by the way. David Tennant. <laughs> <laughs> the 10th uh, Doctor yes. uh, was in, that was when he visited Harry Potter Land. Exactly. And he got a little crazy important. and went to Harry Potter Land. Yeah, so it was very important. He probably ate the wrong chocolate frog. Yeah. <laughs> I've been pondering an important question about flashbacks. Mm -hmm. And that important Ooh. question is, can it be used for humor? And I thought of a great example. Mm -hmm. It is an old, old movie with Veronica Lake called I Married a Witch. And it was the inspiration for all of the bewitched shows yeah, yeah, that yeah, came yeah. later on. Good movie. And it was indeed very funny as they took back to earlier times, to the 1700s and the witch mm -hmm. hunts and being burned, which doesn't sound very funny, but the way they did it, it was because <laughs> it was the beginning of a curse which kept recurring throughout the ages. And there were little snatches of each of those, each a very funny flashback. So, yes, I think flashbacks can even work for humor, if they're done right. Mm. Deadpool. That's, that's yes. exactly where I'm going. Uh, I think they work exceptionally well for humor. Uh, not only does Deadpool start off as a flashback, and I'm not going to ruin everything, but, you know, we, we have a series of flashbacks. Then throughout the movie, they use several flashbacks to get us into certain scenes and part information quickly. And then there's beautifully the, the line where he, you know, breaks several flat you know, where has a flashback within a flashback. Deadpool is his Deadpoolius. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think for humor specifically um, is when you can kind of use it in the absurd and extraordinary. That's our, going back to the, the gizmos for it and mm -hmm. methods of going back in time, like the, the places that you see that the most are always in fantasy and sci-fi. I was, I can't off the top of my head think of anywhere in sci-fi that it happens, but Doctor Who. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Red Dwarf. Red yes. Dwarf. Go back Red to Red Dwarf. Dwarf. But fantasy Dwarf. does that a lot. I mean, <laughs> Game of Thrones does it with uh, constantly going back and looking into the past. That's there. Are whole season two. six going to be about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's. I mean, it's. There are. But there are the two. The two main different ways is that you know are you going back to the past as a third party observer where you can't affect anything that kind of thing and then mm -hmm. I can't off the top of my head come up with a name but I know that I've seen it done where they go back to the past and they actually are inside of the body of someone who's doing something mm. and it's one you can tell the story and two it, it's also used as a actual plot movement device to try to go back to the past and change things and that sort of thing so I mean it's I don't know if that can really be considered a flashback, but it also imparts backstory that you may not have otherwise had. Quantum leap. Thank you. You took okay. waiting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Technically, though, like it is technically a flashback. You're just going from the 
future to the past, but that's more just time travel yeah. because yeah. Yeah. the, the storyline well. doesn't yeah. actually <laughs> usually affect the future except for the couple episodes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was... Uh, uh, I keep It comes in and out of my head. Um, oh, flashback. I wanted to put another flashback uh, option in. Uh, there are... People actually do have flashbacks, like in real life. Mm-hmm. Someone might be having one right now. How traumatic for this radio show! Is. <laughs> um, but flashbacks are a thing that do happen to people, and if your main character has flashbacks after a traumatic event, then you can write that flashback out. I mean, like into your story. I'm if sitting in my files. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Sorry. If uh, you know, it's obviously it's used often for war flashbacks. Mm-hmm. You know, you yes. hear the someone uh, someone's car backfires, and suddenly we're reading a scene about being in Vietnam. That's some you know, that's Jacob's Ladder, mm-hmm. which is a fantastic movie as well. And that was good to add to confusion, but it was yeah. there to to make mood, to make character, and it was used very well there. You can use it in other ways too. Not to um, make light of PTSD, but that mm-hmm. is a you mm-hmm. know a well known symptom of PTSD. So having a flashback, like putting a flashback in your story, you have to look at your character and understand why it's happening. You can use it as a character building yeah. element. I mean, do you want to impart that emotion to the to the reader? Like, if it, you want to show them the the sheer panic that the character experiences, or that that broken aspect that they mm-hmm. come out of it and they're just jarred. Mm-hmm. It can be very powerful when mm-hmm. used that way. Also, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm-hmm. <laughs> great uh, great movie for that. Every three yeah. pages. Yeah. A great movie yeah. for that is Flatliners. I haven't seen Flatliners. Oh, oh that's very good. Flatliners. Very good movie. Hmm. And talking about movies, I was going to mention that we just showed my kids um, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which is one of the first ones that I know of that did the whole break the fourth wall mm-hmm. thing, mm-hmm. and um, of course the scene at the end, my kids were like, oh, I recognize that now. Mm-hmm. And so it was quite funny, but I believe isn't that told in flashback too, because it starts out where... It's got a voiceover, yeah. Like he's so, talking about his day after it happened. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. so, and that was another very good example, besides Deadpool, where they used humor and did it very well. Uh, oh. When you're flashing back in, you're from the point of view of the character. You're flashing, flashing back to things that the character is remembering specifically. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. like, oh, and I remembered uh, that he was wearing these really stupid shoes. <laughs> and then you make a, make a note of those shoes, and it's supposed to be a funny thing that he remembers. Yeah, like he that. adds in breaking the fourth wall on that a few times mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I just I don't know why it bothers just now. Maybe it was the high school that mm-hmm. era, but a very different book. Catcher in the Rye. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Here's a flashback. I mean, if, if the whole story is told in flashback, at the end of the story, a whole lot of my classmates, this is another high school, 11th grade reading, mm-hmm. thought he died when he, oh, spoiler alert, thought the main character died when he committed suicide. I just, I don't well, think you can spoiler alert something so that we were past. all forced to read in high school in America. Yeah. But <laughs> the point is, the book is told from first person, the whole thing's a flashback. Despite this, a good percentage of my class thought the main character was dead at the end of the book. <laughs> well, he's very talented spirit at telling his And story. there are psychiatrists in heaven, yes. or hell, or wherever he is. Oh, Purgatory is a constant psychiatrist <laughs> session. Yeah, can't leave. <laughs> They just keep reminding you of all your traumatic pasts and force you to face them yeah. and recount them and then breaks them down into handy phrases. That, that you might be a good way to recast it. You know, <laughs> you know, Interesting. I have a question. Um, I can't think of any book right now off the top of my head that does this. I'm really having trouble remembering. I know I've seen this in other forms. Have you ever seen a flashback used, read a flashback used, where... This main character or a character is saying, I did blah, 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 and the flashback occurs and shows they really didn't do blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. As a um, con- are using the flashback as a contradiction. Oh. I'm, I'm sure I've read it. Hmm. No, no, the flashback is real. The character is a liar. Yeah, yeah. I, don't a, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have an example. It's a little niche example. It's from my favorite video game of all time. Um, Psychonauts. Oh, Psychonauts. Psychonauts by Double Fine Studios. Uh, Psychonauts 2 is coming out in 2018. I hope fun it. Yay! Um, 
I haven't freaked out about that in about She has months. deep pockets. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> um, but anyway, in Psychonauts, uh, they're hiding who the real bad guy is. Not mm-hmm. not too deeply. I mean, if you're observant, you can figure out who the real bad guy is pretty easily. But uh, in the opening, like, the first couple levels, they give you a truth. Like, this is who this character is. Uh-huh. And then it's revealed as you dig a little bit deeper, because the whole idea of Psychonauts is that you go into people's minds and you uh, sort out all their baggage. Hmm. And you, know, you face their demons and do stuff like that, and you get to you wander across one of those character secrets, and you see that the first memory that you saw was a lie, and that his motivation is that he wanted that to be true when really the other was true. Hmm. So that was it's a very niche example, but it was something I really liked from the game, the whole idea of delving into people's psyche and uncovering their dirty laundry. Um, probably 90% of these dystopian novels that come out now. Mm. I mean, so many of them, you have this, this power and kingdom creation story. I mean, a lot of fantasy novels do it. Sci-fi novels do it. Most times, whenever you, you hear the story of how your, your amazing kingdom came to be, uh-huh. and then you have that, that flashback eventually where some, the, you know, some random character who knows the truth comes back and he's, he either tells a story to, whoever or else it just pops up at the beginning of a chapter at chapter 17 or something they're like ah but but this is real (laughs) uh to avoid huge spoilers uh those of us who have seen captain america civil war at this Mm. point there is actually a vhs tape flashback scene uh that turns Mm -hmm. the whole thing on its head and it does that it takes something that we knew to be true and says oh but by the way and then we all go, whoa, and we can't spoil it because it's brand new and still in theaters, and you all should go yes. see it. It's totally got some great off, punching. Yeah, totally yeah. off topic, but what was that VHS camera doing there? Being, uh, uh being Hydra. a camera. Hydra. And <laughs> they Hail said Hydra. No Hail Hydra. Hail Hydra. <laughs> That's all you need to know. Hail Hydra. Hydra. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, Actually, on. another one I throw out is uh, uh, in the Dragonlance Chronicles, mm-hmm. um, where you get... The High Lords backstory and everything oh, yes. that happened yes. that led up to when they meet five years later. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm not going to go into it all. Wonderful book trilogy. Go check it out. It's like a thousand pages and it's well worth every page. Another yeah. uh, another Dragonlance one is the Test of the Twins one. Yeah. Yes. Constant. Yeah, yeah. Dragonlance Legends on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, uh, Dune. Uh, uh, the four of the God, Emperor of Doom, mm-hmm. the mythology. Although, if, if you've read the first books, you know, but if you start there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, it's a great, like, that flashback truth at the end type twist is fantastic for any book where you've got an, an uh, unreliable narrator. Mm-hmm. Where you are, you know, it's, I guess that's also Jacob's Ladder, too, and a lot of the other examples that we've presented that we have the truth. Um, that's there the whole time, but our main character either is refusing to see it or has forgotten it for some reason. And then the memories happen. The last episode of MASH. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Is a very visceral example of that. Uh, it's being yeah. told in retrospect by Hawkeye to explain why he is, you know, in the place he's at. And emotionally, mentally, uh, physically, you know, like what, what happened to him in this last episode of MASH that ends everything. And, um, he's, I mean, he's hidden a, f- a truth from himself. And through mm-hmm. the episode, it's being pried out of him slowly. By, and, uh, that's, yeah, I mean, like, that, I think everyone remembers. I said it, and everyone I, went, ah, yes. Oh, good. Yeah, I've just, I just a, seen so much MASH, and I don't think I've ever seen the last episode. The last oh, episode. The last episode. episode. Oh, I'm trying, oh, I could see on your face yeah, that you I'm didn't like, know what I'm I was try, talking I'm about, like, so I'm like, I'm not going to spoil it for you. But you got to watch it now. Just go YouTube it. I mean, yeah, I have to now. He's a really good actor. He pulls it out of a hat in that one. He does that good. All right. In the retrospect, in the MASH retrospect, they said that the last episode they wanted to show that war, you know, we made a lot of fun of war, but no one leaves war unharmed. True. And I believe it is even the most watched episode of television ever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Didn't it, like... There was like some sort of a water main problem when everyone flushed the toilet at the same time during yes. the commercial of the last episode of MASH. I think it was at the end, but at, yeah. At the end? Something like that. Like everyone had to get, they were all holding it, and then they all got up at the exact same time and it was to flush the toilet. And it caused a problem it was in the infrastructure. Good. Yeah. <laughs> It's still to this day is yes. the most watched television show of all time. Yeah, that's. I mean, right. I used to. I used to watch it. Yep. Mm-hmm. I lived with a guy that watched T 
two episodes like every morning, six to seven on whatever channel it happened mm-hmm. to be on. And I just happened to sit through and watch it with him every single morning was, for years on end. I can't wait. Well, you, I guess I don't I, show it too often because yeah. it's dramatic. It's on, long. It's on yeah. me TV all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I just to punctuate. Final thing about Mash is one of the few things that my sister left her divorce with happy. She got the <laughs> dog and the Mash box set, and she was pleased. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyway, I was going to say... What... And now a flashback to yes. that story. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to mention a book that just came to my mind. Thanks to you for talking about MASH. Yay, MASH. Because um, Hawkeye was dealing with a psychological situation, and there's an entire book where every other chapter is flashback. And it is sci-fi. It's called Gateway by Frederick Poole. And what it is... The, the, basically, the entire society, our society has found a alien ships, and they are able to travel through gateways, and they're not sure exactly where these gateways go to, and you win lotteries in our games here. And, okay, this book was published in the 80s, so I am doing spoiler alert, nevertheless, if you haven't read it yet, whatever. <laughs> Forget you, on we go. Um, the ship in which the main character has won to go on is going to end up on the, if I remember right, on the edge of a black hole. Oh, that's nice. Ooh, and yeah, he escapes, yeah. he escapes Short end of the in time. Yeah. He escapes just in time before Lotteries everybody inside. else ends up going down the black hole. But the every other, ep- every other chapter is him talking to a computer that is acting as psychologist hmm. and trying to get him to reveal the truth of what happened. Mm. Really good story. Go out and find the book. It's got it's to be in your local library, I'm sure. Your local bookstore will be able to order it for you. If you if you can't do that, then go to Amazon. Sorry, that's a plug for certain local bookstores. Yes. Um, local. Go, go to your indie local. Local. Go to your indie bookstore. <laughs> so we're here now the last couple minutes of the last couple minutes of this episode. Is there anything we haven't covered on flashback? Flashing back to it. Jennifer, are you convinced that every once in a while they can be good? Yes. Well, I was convinced of that before. Oh, okay. I was just uh, stating a strong counterpoint so everyone would jump on me. Yeah. It worked, well, I, too. I, I, I think we all agree not to start with them. <laughs> yes, no, don't don't start with a flashback. No. I think they can be used very effectively, but they shouldn't be your... <laughs> it shouldn't be a flashback if you start with one. Yeah. They don't end with one. It's a promo. Yeah, they call it a promo. <laughs> um, you can... It's, it's a tool that you should use... Uh, Sparingly. Right. Yes. Yeah. Right. Use it to great effect. Therefore, it will be powerful and essential to your story, mm-hmm. as opposed to using it all the time, and then it'll feel like a chore, and it will confuse your audience. So, uh, if your flashback is essential and important, uh, then you know own that thing mm-hmm. and make it as essential and important as it needs to be. Don't be embarrassed. Exactly. And have it be something that makes sense to the story, where it takes place, how it takes place. And if it's long enough, make it an actual scene that you spell out somehow, as opposed to having it be a story that is told out loud in dialogue tags that then the audience falls asleep in the middle of. Yes, to borrow Jen's term there, please avoid the info info couch. The exposition couch. couch. The exposition couch is different than a... Okay, I think it was the yeah, info it's a bamboo trap. Yeah, bamboo, 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 bamboo trap. Yeah. Well, if bamboo you would like trap. to understand where all these terms came from, please look back in season one. Of the I was going to say, you need to write this video. book, actually, yeah, just so that we can refer to it. I, if, I'm taking, if you have any other terms to add to the, the term book that I now have to write, <laughs> yeah. just put them on the Facebook group. Yes, please find us on Facebook or on Tumblr. We, have, we are also on Twitter. Any of those locations we work out. Google us. Click a link. And on that note, we're going to tell you have a great week writing. Tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Next week on Right Pack Radio, the Right Pack will explore word choice and setting the mood. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.